Hi, this is Larry Mantle, host of Air Talk on KPCC. Since the start of the coronavirus pandemic, we've had a daily segment on Air Talk devoted to the latest information about COVID-19. As time's gone on, we've looked at vaccines and how the virus and pandemic have affected the lives of Southern Californians. That includes doctors, nurses, epidemiologists, and other medical professionals fighting the virus on the front lines. In each episode of this podcast, we'll speak with one of our experts on the rotating panel of AirTalk guests. They'll be sharing their expertise with us daily. You can also listen anytime at las.com kpecc.org, or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. We're talking with Dr. Peter Chin Hong of UC San Francisco Medical Center Infectious Disease Specialist. Rick in San Jose says, I'm recovering from COVID. I tested positive last Friday. I hope you're feeling better, Rick. I've got some business trip uh, flights coming up in the next couple of weeks. I feel I've pretty much recovered, but I want to know when will it be safe to travel by air again so I don't get my fellow passengers sick? Would a rapid test help in determining this, or is it too close to my illness? Oh, so again, he tested positive last Friday. That's Rick in San Jose. Dr. Chin Hong? So, Rick, I hope you're feeling better, too. I know it's it's a drag for anyone, even if they get infected. Um, in terms of when you're safe to travel, um, you can try to travel earlier if you use a test at day five, after with day zero as being the first uh, day of symptoms. If you're, neg- if you're still positive then, uh, you can try to then test every day until day 10 if you have the, enough rapid tests available or sort of sequence them. So in other words, instead of just waiting for day 10, you can do it at day seven. If you're negative, then you can then, uh, you know, you're not going to be as transmissible. Uh, I wouldn't test on day 10 uh, because I wouldn't know what that means. And and uh, if you don't have enough tests, definitely at day 10, you will be safe to travel wearing your mask, just like everybody else still on the plane. Also, it setting aside infectivity, if Rick... Um if Rick's just kind of feeling low, you know, like the symptoms are lingering, is it okay for him to travel or might might that set back his recovery if he does that? Yeah, so in general, when you go to a healthcare professional and you talk about having had an illness and you, um, you know, say you're feeling blah and you wondered about, wondered about exercise, the general advice is to go ahead and, and exert yourself. But what we're learning about with chronic symptoms after COVID, which is not what Rick has yet, but say you continue to have symptoms for weeks after, um, that actually seems to be counterintuitive and seems to get worse uh, with with chronic symptoms after COVID. So, you know, I think in general, the answer is get out and push your body as far far as you can, uh, except if you really have chronic symptoms from COVID. All right. Rick, uh, hope, glad you're feeling somewhat better. Hope uh, you're fully recovered very, very soon. Laura in El Sereno asks, do you think we're going to see a vaccine requirement for K-12 through students for the upcoming academic school year, fall of 22? Uh, and are boosters being considered uh, for approval for younger kids? Those are great questions from Laura. I think it will all be hinged on whether or not you know, there is FDA approval uh, for the vaccines. I think it will sit better on on people in the community uh, at that point. The reason why is, you know, if our cases continue to be low and I'm crossing my fingers that they will for some time, there'll be less sort of like public health urgency to do something ahead of a full FDA approval. Um, and so I think that's the way it will play out. Uh, there'll probably be some debate. There will be religious and uh medical exemptions allowed for COVID vaccines initially is my prediction versus the other vaccines in California where it's very, very strict, generally very little room for religious or medical exemptions. So I I think there'll be kind of like an in-between phase and then probably a more full embrace once we have a better sense of how the vaccine works in kids. Erwin in Brentwood emailed to ask, are there any clues as to why our immunity decreases with age? <clears throat> that's that's a great question from Erwin. Uh, I don't think we really uh, understand the exact mechanism, but we do know that 
uh, there is a relative immune suppression as uh, individuals get older. Your immune cells just get a little bit more sluggish, but they're still active. And there's probably a wide range in what that means as somebody gets older. So, um, you know, there's some immune cells that get regenerated very quickly. Um, others don't get as regenerated very quickly. So it's just probably not the components are still there. They're just a little less agile but very, very different from, say, somebody who's immunosuppressed because of medications we give them or if they've just gotten a uh, solid organ transplant. So we don't think about it the same way. It's more of like a, you know, maybe you're, you're like 95 out of 100 versus 100 out of 100, whereas somebody who's gotten a bone marrow transplant recently, that's like, you know, you're zero out of 100. And and I also think about, because that's a good questioner when asking about our immune systems, then there's also the issue of our resiliency as we age once we've become infected. For example, we know that people who are older, if they get pneumonia, that it's much more difficult typically for them to throw that. It can be much more serious than if someone who's 35 gets a case of pneumonia, for example. So what what is what is that in the aging process? Process that makes it harder to throw things off and makes the symptoms much more dangerous in some cases um, when we do get sick? Well, I think um, one, one area in geriatrics and even in many parts of infectious disease uh, and transplantation that people have been talking about is a concept called frailty. I think we don't understand exactly why, but we do know that uh, somebody's ability to quote unquote bounce back after an illness probably, um, you know, affects how they will do overall. Um, and, and, and that's been seen in multiple fields so that people are actually measuring, for example, how fast you can lift, sit up from a chair X, you know, number of days after, uh, an illness as a measure about overall health more than just like the, you know, your blood tests or your lab tests or, you know, whether or not the infection has gone out of your body. All right. Thanks so much. Now, on the opposite end, I'm looking at these incredibly healthy young men who play professional football, Dr. Uh, Peter Chen Hong. Aaron Donald, uh, the incredible uh, defensive lineman for the Rams, just took his shirt off. And it it uh, it doesn't even look real. <laughs> it's muscles. I know. It looks, it looks like... Um, you see like GI a from a super, yeah, right yeah. from a superhero film. Um, well, that's all that hard work, uh, that goes into, uh, building him up. So he's there shirtless on what's a rather cool Southern California morning as he's out on the parade route on Figueroa, sunny, but, uh, but somewhat cool morning, uh, as the Rams players on the double decker bus are getting close to arriving at exposition park. And that's Donald who's holding the Lombardi trophy. Uh, holding it as he um, engages with the fans. They're yelling back and forth with him. Uh, and I think also uh, perhaps with the LAPD officers that are there. They're in single file on motorcycle flanking and uh, looks like they're having some fun in the repartee going back and forth at the Rams victory parade that's taking place. Your questions for Dr. PCH at 866-893-KPCC. Rod in Irvine says, I'm 64. I received my Pfizer booster in September. Should I get a fourth shot soon? In May, it'll be nine months since I've had my last, and I'm unsure if my previous one will still be effective by then. Yeah, those are all pertinent questions uh, that Rod is asking, them, which we have not great guidance right now. I know a lot of people are thinking about informally getting a fourth shot uh, above, you know, say a uh, certainly above the age of 65, 64 is, is close. Um, and we don't really have good guidance. I'd say the official word is not at this moment. Um, and it all depends on what the guideposts or what your goalposts are. Uh, if your goalpost is to prevent infection, uh, even with mild symptoms, that's probably going to wane in efficacy after three to six months. But your ability to fight serious disease will probably remain very robust after three shots in a non-immunocompromised individual. Um, but I think all this guidance will change very quickly. I know informally some people are looking, for example, at the level of spike protein antibody in the test, but we don't really have good guidance around that. But I know that uh, this is a, a very changing Area, you know, Israel, uh, other countries um, are thinking about uh, have doing this fourth shot 
but in the U.S. here, we, you know, we we are not really um, having that as part of the the public discourse as yet. Dr. Peter Chin Hong joining us on Air Talk eight six six eight nine three KPECC. We have a question from Sarah who emailed us with mandates being lifted. What happens if there's another surge? Will people accept another mask mandate or will they rebel against it? Well, it depends on when that surge is. Um, and and Sarah's right. Nobody will probably know what how the public will feel. It probably will be very regional. But I hope that we'll be flexible. And um, there are two things that we think about when we get the next surge. One is, what is the impact of just getting an infection would be? And number two, what would the impact of getting serious disease? That is, the hospitals being filled up. I think if the surge comes very quickly, or even if it comes in the fall again, um, I feel our hospitals will be relatively protected because we have such uh, large amounts of population immunity right now. But of course, you never know with COVID. Um, for the first point, prevention of infection, uh, that is going to be tough because if people are fatigued still from wearing masks, um, you know, there may be more infections or breakthrough infections going around. And the, the hard part about that is not necessarily you feel bad, but that with isolation guidelines now, you be taken out of the workforce for at least five days, if not longer. So I think and schools even. So I think that's, you know, what we are grappling with as a society. All right. Uh, Alex in Highland Park says, what have studies shown about uh, the efficacy of prevention between our health mandates and places in the country that had lesser mandates? A lot of the southern states, for example. Uh, what differences did we see about in the spread of COVID? I think some of the most compelling data I've seen recently was actually just um, a day yesterday or uh, from um, Dr. Galli when he presented some of the data around uh, how California has done in terms of the update and, and, you know, when they made the announcements about schools having a pause before relooking at mass mandates in schools on February 28th. But in that data sl- set, uh, that slide set he showed, California actually had I think it was the lowest uh, number of deaths per 100,000. And I thought that was really compelling to me uh, versus, uh, you know, other states where some of these risk mitigation factors were not quite as well enforced. So again, it's not like one thing like masks or testing or, or vaccinations. It's multimodal. And I think overall California did much better than many, many other places. But if you look at the U.S. in general, versus the rest of the, the, the world, particularly the other developing, developed countries, we're like trailing behind pretty much everybody uh, in terms of deaths per 100,000. And it really speaks to uh, whether or not we embraced uh, all of these risk mitigation uh, strategies fully, and we didn't as a country. So it really shows in our deaths per 100,000. As as we lift these restrictions, Dr. Chin Hong, are rapid tests still going to be important for people to use before, say, attending events or gatherings? Do you think that that people should not be shy about using those before they get together um, with significant numbers of people? Yeah, so that's a great question. I think we're going to be in evolution with that as well. And it depends on the purpose. Of course, if you're visiting um, uh, vulnerable people um, like parents or grandparents, et cetera, you might want to do it to be safe. But I think as the numbers of cases go down in the community, the more it goes down to very few, the higher the chance that, that any test will have a false positive. So that's going to change the performance of the tests. But right now there's still enough COVID where I think it's still worthwhile doing. And But of course you prioritize symptomatic disease over asymptomatic testing. But given the fact that enough is going around still, I would still do it if I had to. But as it goes down very, very low, the more you do it, as an asymptomatic person, the higher the chance of a false positive. Finally, Dr. Chin Hong, your thoughts about Disneyland lifting its mask requirement for vaccinated guests and um, the promoters of Coachella and the Stagecoach Festivals in Indio say they won't require proof of vaccination, won't, pro- won't require negative tests or masks for those events coming up later this year. I think all of these... Um, uh, 
events, particularly Coachella and Stagecoach, they're going to benefit from the timing. So I think that, you know, by the time these occur in, you know, what is it, April 15th and then April 22nd and then the following weekend for Stagecoach, our virus should be very, very low at that point. So it should be relatively, un, you know, not so risky to do it. And so it was lucky that they, that this timing works out. And also, you know, I think it would, it would have been hard to enforce it, uh, for for example, for Stagecoach, because, you know, so much of the vaccines have been politicized. So I think that's all going uh, together for the organizers. At the end of the day, I think people have to be expecting uh, flexibility in case, un, you know, unexpectedly we get another surge, which I don't expect will happen. But again, uh, the right timing doesn't mean that other concerts later on in the year would be the same way. Mm -hmm. But of course, we do all know that it's a bellwether for a lot of live tours. Dr. Peter Chin Hong, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks for listening to this episode of COVID in L.A. If you'd like to stay up to date with the latest coronavirus news, you can listen anytime at LAist.com, at kpcc.org, or subscribe wherever you download podcasts. See you next time and stay safe. I'm Larry Mantle.